And we're back and welcome ladies and gentlemen to Pasco Laboratories. It's so nice to have you with us again today. I am JP and today, Roger, the P stands for point. point. And I want you to remember that word point because it's not just point, but it's data point. Data point. And why is it data point? Well, because we have a special celebration. But before we get to that celebration, I want you to know that if you remember that word point, point. I'm going to give you 10% off something very spectacular <laughs> that you're going to see here very shortly. And that 10% off is with that promo code POINT. So, as I said, I'm here with Roger today. We're live and we certainly like all of you joining us live, which means if you've got a question, you can write into us and we're happy to hear from you. We know that Roger's wife is watching today. Hello, Anita. Hello, Anita. Nice to have you joining <laughs> us. And to all of our friends out there who are watching, nice to have you here. And Roger, when I think about data, and I think about like data points, and what, what I often relate to is weather. Because when I watch the weather, they've got points all over. And I yeah. want to know what's it doing here in California, what's it doing in Florida, because you know what it's doing in Florida. Absolutely. But, but these are all data points. And so a really nice way to kind of kick off what we're doing is looking at weather. And a really nice reason we're doing that is because we're celebrating something special. We're celebrating GIS Week, aren't right. we? GIS data points are the basis for a lot of kinds of sciences from geography, which it's Geography Awareness Week as well. We'll give the kudos out there to geographers, um, but also to environmental scientists and earth scientists and chemists and physicists the like. So. so there's a lot that we can celebrate with GIS Week. And of course, we're celebrating a little bit early. GIS Week is actually next, next week, week, so you still have time to get your shopping in. And I'm going to show you what you want to buy. That's but, it. But Roger, we're talking about um, weather and kind of GIS, and I want folks to know that you can do some great weather stuff at home just by using an at-home thermometer, which now 100% of the planet now owns an at-home thermometer. And checks themselves on a regular basis, I know. Right. But you can do some weather stuff with this, can't you? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you've got a little uh, container of water. Um, just knowing what the temperature is when it's not in water and then bringing it back out of the water when it's wet, that evaporation will tell you a lot about the atmosphere. If it's a drier condition, your temperature will go lower. It can help you to figure out what your dew point is. The dew point is where the water starts to condense out of the air and create clouds and storms like we're seeing. California, we're just heading into our wet season, so that's going to become important as well. So you can measure a lot of stuff with just a thermometer at home where you can start taking a look at humidity, relative humidity, absolute humidity, dew point is it going to actually be some precipitation you can start figuring that out but if you have the ability to use something that is more data driven like this in this case a wireless temperature sensor let me show you what I can pull here Roger I've got this uh, temperature sensor hooked up I've got my temperature sensor there in that little thing of water and uh, and I am just collecting some data and you can see I'm just collecting some data in the water watch what happens when I pull that sensor out of the water what well, we the see water here? was nice and stable and kept its temperature, but now that it's out, we talked about evaporation. As those molecules leave, they're the ones that are moving fastest. The warmest molecules are leaving, and so what's left behind are cooler and cooler molecules. And the really neat thing here, like we were talking about before, is I can take a look at this area on the graph, and if I want to drop a line on that, I'm able to get the slope here. My slope is 0.157, and that's degrees Celsius per second, which is great. And if I know the rate, I can figure out the rate of, that is, the rate of evaporation, and I can start talking about humidity, relative and absolute, and we can start taking a look at weather. I mean, that's real weather. I mean, we, can, we can actually measure that just with a thermometer or a, a wireless sensor. Right? And this is not your parents' thermometers, I'm telling you, because together with that and what we'll talk about in a minute in terms of weather, um, I think you're going to find that you can do a fantastic number of things. Oh, and, and now that you've kind of like preempted it, let me just say we are talking about weather. And so let me show you, this is great, right? This is wonderful. But let me show you something that is so spectacular, you're not going to believe it. I'm telling you right now, just hold your socks on because they're going to be blown off. Look at that. that blown off is right and I can actually measure it. That's right. <laughs> this is our wireless weather sensor that collects a whole bunch of stuff you might be saying oh yeah what does it collect well it collects so much stuff that I'm well I'm going to show you well exactly not just temperature oh, not no, just humidity not, not just temperature <laughs> not just humidity let me get this where did it go let me find that for you not three four five things no how many things Roger I'm telling you you can get 17 additional 17 kinds of measurements about the things. environment so let me connect my sensor here I'm going to turn this on so easy turn this on Bluetooth hook onto my 
weather sensor. It is now connecting. And when I open this up, before I even go anywhere, Roger, take a look at all the things <sighs> that this can measure. So we're looking at a tremendous number of uh, pieces of data. We talked about data points. This right. is all data that can be pulled out of here. So we've got some data points here. And the really neat thing that I want to show about this is I can open up a weather dashboard that looks just like what everybody's very familiar with. This is a weather station. And if I start collecting that information, look at what it's going to do. It starts populating all oh of gosh. that great data in there. And I think so, about my middle school students coming in and just being able to look at that before a class starts. That'd be awesome. Right. And for any discussion with weather, whether it be weather right here, because I'm just collecting it right here in this little microclimate, I mm -hmm. guess we would say you could take this outside and collect that data, or you could put this outside and collect it over a week and come back and take a look at that data over a week. And that's, that's exciting, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that, those are data points. That's real data points. And what I want to show you, even kind of a little funky and a little exciting that, that, that I thought it was kind of neat. Let me show you what I did with this, Roger. This device is able to uh, get wind speed. And so let me open a little experiment that I did that was looking at wind speed. I built this file already. And you're using our software SparkView, um, which for phones and mobile devices is free to download from their app stores, which would be great. Right. And so I built a lab that should open here, hmm. should open here. I built this <laughs> lab that should open here. So SparkView not only visualizes data like we see from this probe, okay, but we also have a computing sort of an atmosphere in that interface, which would be fantastic for students to learn scientific computing mindset. Um, to be able to take measurements and make some kind of criteria for the computer to do something more. And the wonderful thing about being live, Roger, is that when something goes wrong, it goes wrong all the way. Keep and rolling. of course, my computer is completely and totally frozen. And so I'm not, I'm not going to open that file for you just now. Uh, hopefully, I'm going to be able to open that file for you shortly. But the important thing is, and I'll show you this later, is that with this weather sensor, you're able to capture data and not just capture data locally, but the thought is, what if I could take that data and look at it globally, and then I could connect it to all kinds of data that might be available. And that's where we are today as we celebrate GIS Week, Global Information Systems, and some of the neat things that Roger was able to do with this device going out into the field. Roger, tell him about that. Two of the things that are being measured with this device are the GPS coordinates, your latitude and longitude, how far you are from the equator north in degrees and how far you are around the world from England. And so that is going to be like an address system for you. It can find your position on any map. That's going to be nice because that's going to be stored for every one of those other kinds of of um, measurements that we make. And since it's National GIS Day um, coming up next week and we're starting and kicking it off, I want to talk about how you can get started. Um, you may have seen our promo, which was a lot of fun to sort of film, uh, but uh, we just took this outside and I partnered it onto my phone. Uh, that is done simply by starting up Spark uh, View and we have a little icon at the top um, if you want to see my phone, and I'm just going to click on that Bluetooth sort of device, and I make sure, yes, oh, that's right, let me, uh, oh, you've got to pair up with that's that. That's right. Let me do you that. You certainly don't need to see my computer as it remains frozen. Let's take a look at what's on your phone. Put that up on the screen. Okay, let me screen mirror so we can see that. Thanks for the reminder. And what I'm going to do is hook this device up to my phone by clicking on the Bluetooth symbol at the top. Um, on the right side, there's a set of symbols, and it's the Bluetooth one. And I look and I see, yes, indeed, I have this um, weather sensor is hooked up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we're going to go outside with just these two devices. And I'm going to walk in that field and just start. It. This is done. I'm going to hit that Start button, and we're going to go, and I'll show you what that looked like here shortly. Let's go ahead and bring that up, and I'll maximize this so you, if you missed out on it. That was so much fun. Let's do it again now that you can see it.
Fantastic. Let's try that again. If I walk outside. We'll lap down and back. We'll put it in fast motion so that you can see what I'm doing. And we'll come back into the lab and take a look at what that looks like on a map. Excellent. Did they see that, Roger? I think they saw that one. <laughs> if I have to run that field one more time that fast, I'm going to have right. a heart attack. And, and I'll tell you something. We are live, of course. And if you've got any questions, feel free to write in. By the way, I am Jay Keener at Pasco.com. And if you have questions, you can email them. Uh, Brett is standing by. And actually, we have a question coming in. What's the question, Brett? It's not so much a question, but I think it could be a question. Sure. It says, I envision students generating local weather maps. I That's see awesome. students generating local weather maps, <laughs> not only generating them, but showing them, producing them, That's doing right. their own live show. Um, and Roger's going to show you exactly what that looks like. Great, I'm, great it, point. I'm going I'm to hit a couple of points to show how we go from the very easiest steps, I'll level up, and then we'll get to sort of that cool ability to do this. So I will not, um, I mean, I'll come back to answering that question because I think it's part of the presentation we're going in. So let's continue to move forward. What you'll do is that this is just getting started. For those of you that are saying, wow, I would love to do that, but I'm not so sure. I'm you know, super confident with technology. Your students have phones uh, and, and getting a small device like this will be all they'll need to get started. You can maybe see my phone right now. What's cool about this is right now I'm showing the temperature. Um, on my phone. But if I wanted to explain why is it a little warmer in one corner of the field than the other, I could go in there and I'll click on that temperature sort of uh, button in the top and I might go in and say, well, maybe it's because the kind of light that's there. And students can be doing this kind of, you could be doing this kind of teaching. Let me go just to the illuminance, for instance, and we'll get a new map. But all of those variables, um, as that kind of crows through there, are going to come up and show up on the map. Or not. Oh, go, go, little guy. Where did those variables go? Let me just do that one more time. Uh, we'll take a look at humidity in case that was. And are we still on? Yep. Well, and that's okay because I'm going to come over here to where I've sent that. When I'm done, what I'd like to do is send that data to myself by email. And here's that data that we. Um, can see, oh, that's my connectivity, um, which is going to be my level up. I'm going to continue working as I go through that one um, and say, what ways can I not only then just compare two variables, um, but to actually get out there and get something besides what can be measured just on the weather sensor? So now, the weather sensor itself is able to collect 17 pieces of individual data, and you're able to take all of that information, 17 pieces of information, and lock that in, lock that in with GPS. The GPS is right there in the system itself, isn't it? Absolutely. Like you're asking me, like, how does it know where I am? How does it know where I am? The GPS sensor in here is measuring data coming from satellites, which will triangulate where you are, in addition to all the information about the wind and the humidity and the temperature that's being gathered in this upper corner. So all of those together. So that's being streamed to my phone, and that is then going to be what I'll be able to visualize as I'm collecting it. Now, that gives you a quick color scheme, and that's great for looking for patterns, but sometimes you want to add some more to it. Uh, for instance, if I want to put one other kind of sensor besides just what's those 17 sensors that are on the weather sensor, um, I can pair another probe to my phone. And let's take a look at what that looks like here. So I can measure everything that's on my weather sensor. I can do all 17 measurements here, but if you wanted to take that a step further, you could pair with any of our wireless sensors, um, temperature, conductivity, pH, all this, the dozens any, and dozens any, of anything growing. Anything that's wireless, I suppose, that's right. that, uh, that you could connect to that. And you are able to pair. It links up directly to the GPS that's already in the system. And so you could start including other neat things into the data points that you're collecting. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and let's make sure I step out of that presentation mode up here. Okay. That look good. Fantastic. And I'll expand this. probes. We'll look for the SparkView app, which is right here on my phone, right there. I'll put that started. This should be your starting page. Choose a path. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect to the sensor data here. So I'll first start with the sensor, and I'll do it both ways so that you see it again. 
First thing I'm going to hook up to is the weather sensor. They're both sitting on my dash up here. But I'm going to hook to the weather sensor and make sure that shows up. It's trying to find it. I'm going to hook the uh, table up with the graph. Question. The weather yeah. sensor hooked up. But I want that other instrument as well. Error. That I'm going to connect up through this Bluetooth signal. Okay, it's the far left on the top here. It looks like some two triangles and a V or so. Um, but that symbol is going to show up. And I'm going to hook up my pH sensor. Notice I did them one at a time just so I didn't have the complication. I just wanted one graph on here and it might get complicated otherwise. Go ahead and start that. All right, now we're talking with the GPS sensor and the weather sensor and all the data that's coming off the other probe. Okay. And well, we're back. That's and right. Roger, that, that was a great way to show that you could take any of our devices and pair it up just like you were hooking it up in your classroom. But here you're using your phone and, and that's really what's so great about this is you're in your car, you're using your phone, you could be out in the phone, uh, out in the field using your phone. This is a great way to collect data anywhere. Right. And uh, while I'm bringing those up, let me address the question that somebody wrote in while this was playing. Um, the question was, how accurate are these GPS? Now, there were a number of uh, vendors that make GPS units that are sport-based that you can buy from a sporting goods store or whatever. Um, a lot of those that came out through about five years ago had probably a size of a room compared to a field. So if you're in a classroom or if you're in your bedroom or your, your kitchen or something, you could come back reliably to a size something like your kitchen and find what was there. You might have to look around a little bit if you left a quarter there and it would still take some time to find it. Um, what's happening is that a lot of that uh, error that was in there was part of the atmosphere and not part of the equipment itself. The accuracy that I'm finding on the GPS that comes in the wireless sensor here for weather um, can find even closer than that. I would say the size of maybe four or five of these tables. Um, so if you've left something there and you've got to come back every time to do a field measurement like on a creek and you want to make sure you're coming back to relatively the same spot because it's not, you know, it's above a certain other creek coming in or something, that you're going to find the place that you need to do for field-based measurement. Um, whether you're going to use this for a building or something where you need it to be centimeters of accuracy, I wouldn't say that's the kind of uh, device you're looking for. You've got to pay a lot more for other kinds of locational services besides the GPS. But as far as the GPS, I found this is as good as any device that I've had as far as a small handheld that doesn't go to the extra expense of, of correcting that signal somehow due to the atmosphere and some of the related kind of techniques that um, can be used. Um, and and I, I think the government super... rating on most devices is about 20 feet. Right. Within, within about 20 feet, you yeah, should you... be able to collect uh, reliable data. Yeah, you think three, four sort of tables that you would have uh, uh, dinner tables or something along those lines. And you'd be able to, again, find what you were looking for while you were there. And so th for that kind of purpose, I think that's what we're excited about, being able to get more and more kids out there, finding the same spot that they're going back to to find what they can measure. Um, here you see I've now taken that uh, GPS device and I've hooked it up with a pH sensor. Um, what this pH sensor is is nice um, that I can show is that I've just put it on the end of a hanger. This is not something this we sell. We don't sell that hanger, right. No. Yeah, don't look for this online. That's right. But you can roll this up into the window of your car and that'll keep the pH sensor. So if it's raining, that you'll be able to tell what the pH is as you drive through town. And that's what I did here when I taught in Dallas. Um, you can see that, that I had it on where I was collecting the points. Notice I don't have to be continuously always connecting points like I did when I was monitoring the temperature from the previous example. I'm hitting the check mark every time that those um, points come in and I'm gathering some data. I put it on a red and blue where acid red and blue base is there so you can see that there's three pH change points on this rainfall just going through a city where there's lots of cars. We have and another doing question. Doing with random sampling, right? Yeah. This, is, this is random sampling instead of just automatic. Right, I'm hitting, the, I'm hitting the, the save point every so often. And we got a question coming in, Brett. So this question is, would it be possible to correlate local weather conditions to COVID-19 activity? Wow, the question is, could we correlate these weather conditions to COVID-19 activity? And I, I think the answer is going to be only if COVID-19 activity is something that's in ArcGIS, which it might be, right? Absolutely. But, and then we're going to take a look at ArcGIS in a little bit. So the answer is possibly, and Roger will explain that, but as soon as we get to ArcGIS, 
and all the different layers of things that might be available. You might notice if you're looking at this shot right now that if you look at the top of there, that, that interface is looking at the GIS software in the online version, ArcGIS Online. Now you may say, well, how did you get that in there? Um, as a matter of fact, I'll even say, if you wanted individual points collected, this is a good example where it was about 10 miles worth of uh, acid rain. Um, here's a good example. Once we answered that question, students said, well, what's it like? Where does that acid go when it goes up in the air from cars? I drove around Dallas, which is about a couple hundred miles worth of data, and that I did take as every so many seconds, so I didn't have to drive and take that data at the same time. Uh, but you see that the acid rain that comes from car exhaust in the downtown area is being blown with the wind and out towards the outer uh, outskirts of the city. That's about a 20 mile radius from downtown Dallas. Now, your question, and now let me go there to answer it, is can we correlate it to anything that's also stored out there? Because if you've been watching COVID-19, you've seen these amazing um, dashboards that show where places, what county numbers are, are, are breaking out. And so if you want, I can take then from my phone, I'm gonna go here, you may see that I've got that pH data that I've got, sorry, this is conductivity data, I've gone to a stream, and I'm gonna send that to myself through the share function. Uh, I'm gonna share it as a whole lab. So I've hit the little V on the top of my Spark view, and I'm gonna share that lab, and it's gonna ask me to put in my email address, for instance. Okay, here's my lab and I can put in my own email address. Now I'm gonna go ahead and cancel because I've already done that. Um, and we're gonna now move over to my computer. I'll minimize my presentation. And what I'm gonna show you is that not only can I view inside of Sparkview with maps that are coming from Esri. These are Esri maps, they're base maps around the whole world. I'm gonna keep backing out, you're gonna notice. These are live, updated as Esri updates those. We're a partner with Esri. Um, and so you can see that I've got great background data. Now, let's take a data set that I emailed to myself and then export it as a table. It's called this conductivity, the stream conductivity table. You can see I've saved it on my computer. So you've exported that as what we would call a CSV file, which is a standard file that you're able to export out of SparkView. Uh, the data is saved in columns, separated by commas, and so it's a comma separated values or C SV5. Right. Not to be confused with CVS, Not, which, which you may need now for COVID. Yes, right. yeah, don't go to CVS. Instead, do a CSV, CSV, and then you just upload that right into this ArcGIS. Right. So I'm going to ArcGIS.com, which is Ken in the free sort of just, it's a, it's a web-based browser. Um, I go to ArcGIS.com and hit that map button at the top. That's going to have a map viewer here. Here's the file straight from SparkView. SparkView is the data collection file. And I want to add this to the map. Watch what I do. Here it is sitting on my drive as a computer file, CSV. I'm going to drag it onto that map. And in the newer browsers, they know how to deal with these, like Chrome or some of the edge and things. Um, it's going to ask me, where is the latitude and longitude or an address sort of field where I can put that data in? And I'm going to so scroll. So it's reading that right off of the file that you dumped in there. That's and you've correct. you've done this live. There's no magic here. Yep. You've dumped this file in. It's now asking, could you identify the column that has your latitude and longitude. It's this giving is, the titles and you're saying, here it is. There's the latitude. I'm gonna tell it that's the latitude column and I'm gonna go down one more and go to longitude and make sure it says, where's the longitude? Here's my longitude. I'm gonna add that layer and it knows exactly how to lie on that map. What's cool about this, and this is just a satellite count. I don't care about that. Let's go to something that we actually did measure like that other probe we put on there, the conductivity sensor. It's right there. And if I want, I don't have to even take these values as sizes, but although the sizes is beautiful, you have all the control that a GIS does. And so what I'll do is let's make that big and you can see that whole map. I'm gonna change instead of being sized options, which is the starting option, I can change that to something that's a color or if I keep clicking on options, I can choose any kind of color or any kind of a split. Notice the X value there, that's the average value. I'm gonna put the splitter right there. So anything lower than the average is yellow on my map. Anything that's got more conductivity is blue. So when that's done, that's the cool sort of extra functionality that now that you've gotten the data on your computer, you can now visualize that. You were saying, can I add more data? Yes, indeed. If you want things like COVID, I need to modify this map. And now I can go into all the online stored data that's out there and I can go off to what's being stored in the web or out in the layers that are part of the tens of thousands of layers and you can search for them just by typing in at the top COVID or some things like that. 
So, so you hopefully could, we you could, you could put in um, barometric pressure, you could put in humidity, you could right. put in weather, you could put in anything. And so this is a great way for you took your data, which is just a couple data points uh, on a very specific line of data, but now you're able to connect it to the full line of possible data that's out there right. uh, available online. It's like going to the library and say, what book do you want? Well, it depends on what you're interested in. I just hit my add button and I searched for layers so that I could compare what I measured to then things that are related to those. And like you said, if you have an interest in those that you could take a look, is there more acid rain in some area? Then that's a question you need to answer and address as you're doing that as a scientist in the measurements that you make. And we have a question coming in, Brett. Question from Ben. Is the SparkView app based on the Esri suite of tools? Thanks for asking those. We are a partner with Esri. Uh, Esri and, and uh, Pasco Scientific are partners, but SparkView is the list of our sort of entry data entry app, and that is what partners together with our probes. And so that's the, that's the software that's gonna grab the data that you're measuring, and then if you send it to your desktop, you can save it as a, like a table, a spreadsheet. Now, if you take that spreadsheet, you can put it into the software that Esri provides, if you have the desktop software or if it's online, which I was showing, which is free and accessible just by going to arcgs.com. If you have an organizational account, which schools can ask for, um, then you would have even more functionality, like you could do more analysis. But if you just want it to show up for free, um, you could put SparkView on your phone, link it to a device that you would get, and then the data you'd email yourself could then be put onto a map that's also in a free environment. So we're really talking about GIS Day sponsored by many companies, but Esri has sort of a large share of the market and they have an online mapping system at arcgis.com which you can take our data measured in SparkView and then be visualized on there or you can just visualize it in SparkView because SparkView is being um, supporting a map view. That map view is coming from Esri. So Excellent. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, it's nice to be a partner with Esri. Yeah. So that's a great way to bring in all sorts of other data as you were asking and I think that you can see that you can gain some great value. As a matter of fact, now I'm talking about conductivity. Let me bring up my presentation and say, well, what if kind of a project uh, might you be able to have? Let me put this in presentation mode. And please keep asking the questions. Those are great, great questions. Um, we're here for you guys. Uh, if you're here to be interested and ask those kinds of questions, we're excited. Let's take that conductivity. You may say, well, pff, that conductivity of your stream didn't change very much. Well, that's true. But you might live in an area where conductivity is super interesting. I used to teach in North Dakota, as you can see here. Um, in the upper quadrant of the state next to Minnesota. Um, there was a small stream that came through and we decided we're gonna take that conductivity sensor and the GPS sensors and we're gonna measure what's the conductivity. We went back over time, once in the summer, once in the spring, once in the fall, once in the uh, summer, um, whatever one I missed <laughs> going so through those. One of our seasons. Yes, yep. starting in the summer, going through the full year there. You can see that part of this stream, which flows to the, your right, if you're looking at this, to the, um, to the east, uh, is very not much, there isn't much conductivity, though it's a fairly clean stream, around 500. But as you get to this right side, you're going to notice about six times the conductivity. And we thought, oh, there's a story to tell. Somebody's polluting or some golf course is leaking their uh, fertilizer and it's going into the river. Right, because I can see it's a big shift in numbers. A question coming in, Brett. Um, so these organization accounts, do schools have to pay? No, organizational accounts from Esri are free for requesting. You do have to go to Esri's site, arcgs.com, or look up Esri. If you Google this, is going to be the easiest. Esri uh, organizational accounts, and you'll find that they are offering those to schools free for, that's the, the long before there was COVID, they were offering those to schools for free. So if you want to email us, absolutely please do, um, and I will follow up with you uh, to get you in touch with how to get that that set up, but it's it's at Esri, and if you just look up Esri educational accounts in Google, I'm sure you will land on the page where you can ask for a free account. Okay, next question. Yeah, another question, Brett. Um, thanks for making this compatible with ArcGIS. My students are doing a project with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and RISE. We will need to be gathering data and posting it to Arc as one piece. Looks like the Pasco equipment might be perfect to help us with this project. The question is, everything is compatible via cell phone? Correct. Any cell phone, both Android and uh, um, iOS, can. We, you can go to the store and get the SparkView app. 
um, which will talk to the sensor. The sensor will give the numbers to the phone. You email yourself through the sharing function, um, and then you would then take and open that up in your computer to, to save it out as a comma-separated value. From there, you would then add it to the GIS uh, and the neat field. thing is, Roger, because we had talked about this a little bit offline, if you've got 10 students working on a project, you've got 10 files, but once you have that one account in ArcGIS, That's right. everybody's dumping that same data into that one account, and then you have all of your students' data on one account being displayed uh, in one location, and then you can bring in both your national or your global view just using the multiple layers. And I will say there's there's several ways to do those things. Most from our side, there's one. You get it on your phone, you email yourself. Once you get into the GIS side, there are ways to you know marry that data together. And if that's um, that's just dealing with the complexity of cities that gather from many people or schools that gather with many people. So please feel free to stay in touch with that with us. Give me an email um, if you would like, um, and maybe I'll get somebody to put that up. Or, or just, just uh, no one have them uh, put my email up there. Yeah. And anytime you've got questions that you need for Roger, just email me. My email, jkeener at pasco.com, and we're happy to fo uh, forward those over. Yeah, so we'll support you in that sort of effort to get the data to come from our, our sensors into GIS. Brett, we've got a question coming in. How many SparkView devices do you envision needing for one class, say 25 students? If you've got, really, the sensor is what you Well, the answer is 25, Roger. Well, exactly, because every student's <laughs> going to have a phone. If you have a phone, it's a, it's, a, it's a free app that goes onto the phone. And so that's obviously what students are going to be bringing out to the field. What you'll need, though, is to be able to censor something, um, not censor, but have a sense uh, sensor that dumps data into your phone, and that's going to have a Bluetooth connection. Once one Bluetooth connection has been made, that's a pair. So if, for instance, yeah, my my recommendation is usually three or four would be the most where one student has the phone and is gathering the data. The other student can have the probe that's going to be sent. A third person is going to be making notes. Maybe you have a camera. So if you send them out in teams of three or four, then the question is, well, if I have a class of 24, yeah, you should have maybe six probes. I think Something that's a pretty like that. standard and, way and to send out And the thing is, yeah, I, I would like to say 25 because that that's sales and that's what sales are all about. But sure, for a classroom, you probably only need five or six. And the really nice thing is that although one person's collecting the data on SparkView, if you go onto our website and, and search shared session, you'll see some neat little videos on how you can share data live with the other members of your group. So five members in a group, everybody with a phone, one person with their weather sensor collecting data, but all five people getting that same live data instantaneously on their phone through a live shared session. So one probe, five people, everybody getting the same data instantaneously, all saved, all able to be manipulated. One person exports out and drops it onto the map and you've got yourself a class project. And if you've got a single team that's gathering data, they're putting it into the online environment. Uh, there's ways that that can be simultaneously shown as the data is collected. So all of those, again, are things that you want to write in and we'll, we'll spend the time that it takes uh, to help you get that, that sort of direction where you're measuring something, it's going onto a map, and immediately it's showing up to anybody in the world that's looking at. So that's the, that's the value we get as being a partner to Esri, is that they're putting it onto a cloud-based system from which anyone can see. So those are great, great questions. I'm going to continue, and we'll continue to uh, look for student que or participant questions that are coming in. But here was our example, sorry, I was going backwards there, um, that we're going to move forward and saying, let's add to our idea of conductivity. Conductivity is one thing, but what does it do and impact that which lives in that creek? Well, our students went out and gathered the bugs they could find, the macroinvertebrates. The finer the tails, like if they had fine whip tails or fan tails, uh, means that they are more susceptible to pollution. They're intolerant to pollution. If they're more like snails or slugs or uh, leeches or things like those, they're they are more tolerant to pollution. So they gathered bugs and put those bugs that they found into three classifications. And uh, oops, what we see is here's that same map of the conductivity. And the green is those that are sensitive to pollution. And the red on the right side, where it's salty, are those that were existent in that same area. So that was an awesome way to think about how conductivity can make a difference in terms of a project your students can address. And tying it together with both the, the life forms, yep. the conductivity, and bringing in the layers that you would get from GIS. We have a question coming in, Brett. Where do we go for that area that Jay Keener just told us about? Can you put the link here, please? That area. For sure that a deal, is that right? No, I think, um, boy, I don't know which area. The, um, Send us a oh, second. Uh, I bet you, yeah, if you, 
uh, who, whoever that is, and, and Brett will tell me, if you'll just write me, jkeener at pasco.com, you might be looking for that talk about a shared session. And yeah. In which case, go to the pasco.com website and take a look at resources. Under resources, you will find video library. And in our video library, all the videos of all the things that you can do with Pasco Proware, type in the word shared session and it's going to pop up and it will show you how you can connect a shared session on any of your phones or if you're sitting at home and you want your kids to be collecting your data at home you can do a shared session that way also so type in shared session if you can't find it no problem jkeener at pasco.com and i will send you the link directly and hopefully that's what you were asking and hopefully you'll find what you're looking for yeah those are fantastic questions i really appreciate it. and keep sending those in as we go um i know you'll stay here as long as you can and uh, yes that was yeah, okay, ah, cool. Excellent. And, and Roger, I'm beginning to think this is all your wife. So, Anita, thank you for all the questions that you're asking. <laughs> Absolutely. And you may notice that a lot of these, like we share into YouTube, can be searched as well. If you're looking for shared sessions, you might find it there if you don't find it on our site. But we, we have them in a special area on our site as well. So, thank you for those. All right, let's continue on. Other kinds of questions you can ask. Like I said, what does conductivity show? It showed where certain kinds of insects can live. What if you want to show a relationship between two separate kinds of probes, one that measures water temperature and one that measures oxygen? On the left, this is in uh, Memphis area where they have the island, Mud Island, and you were looking at oxygen on the left. As it gets warmer, it's getting redder. Okay, as it gets warmer down the, the stream, it's a, it's a model of the Mississippi. On the right side, the oxygen is showing. And there, I'm trying to show the oxygen's color, red for oxygenated and blue for not oxygenated. And you see as the temperature warms up, the oxygen is leaving. Oh, so that's a nice way to take two sensors, again, and put them together. Temperature right off of our weather sensor and dissolved oxygen off of our dissolved oxygen sensor and linking them together. You can see that on the phone as you've measured both oxygen and the temperature, or you could send it off to a GIS, which is what I've done here as I'm looking at it in a GIS. Very nice. All right. Maybe how does temperature change as you drive off? We live right nestled up against the mountains, and so if I come from here and go up to Auburn, which is... Uh, several hundred feet higher. It's a warmer day here in March um, where it's in the upper 90s and then as we go or actually 100 I think on that particular day and it comes down to 95. So even a six or so degree drop in temperature I'm inside of Sparkview there, our software, uh, to measure temperature as I drove up and this is sitting as a, as a probe outside of my window in the car. As a um, passenger as a passenger, right? Window in the car. Or right. my wife is holding those, and right. sorry that you're always into my science experiments, but sometimes <laughs> that was what you got into when you married me. Um, of course, I took that data and I dropped it into ArcGIS Online, and then I asked about one more piece of data, like, let's go look at the radar reflectivity at that same time. Oh, this is beautiful. This is another way we're showing those layers, and, and remember somebody had asked earlier, like, can I do weather maps, or can I talk a little bit about weather coming in? Yes, here is something Roger collected. He collected his own temperature right there, hand out the window, driving up the mountain. He goes on to ArcGIS Online, opens up that layer that is precipitation, and what do we see? You see the radar showing there was precipitation. Why? Because it got cooler as the air moved up the mountain. And it's a great topic for earth science. So even following that up, you can find other sites then once they've done these kinds of activities to see if they understand by going off to CERT, for instance, NOAA site, which gives a great weather sort of report every day this is given live and it's then can confirm what some of their ideas are. Uh, but I'm just saying that's one idea that you can follow up on. I mean, there's conductivity. You can go to the U.S. Geological Society's page on water quality. If it's, you know, any of these other kinds of sites, there's always something you can follow that up with and see if they've grown in their understanding of students. So as we've come here to show, GIS Day is an amazing uh, tool. GIS Day is a, a celebration of how that can be <laughs> done in GIS Week. Um, and that why do we think that it's important to partner with a, a company like Esri is because data shown on maps is absolutely fun and students love it. They do. They don't love just the data, but they love the relationships that you can establish with that data. I might collect temperature, but then I relate it to precipitation. And now I've just connected that real world connection data I collected with the real world. And so that's a great relationship. And of course, what we would like to have is a relationship with you. Uh, and if we could do that, that would be terrific. We have 
all the desire to answer your questions. And remember this wonderful promo that I told you about. This weather sensor can be yours. That's right. It's our 10% off promo all the way until the end of December. 10% off this weather sensor so that you can connect and start collecting data. If you're teaching online or finding out today that you're starting to teach online tomorrow, you want to teach weather, you just need one. You can link with your students, show them all the great things that you're doing. Start doing labs directly with your students with real data, with real software. The software, by the way, is free, and they can start doing this stuff at home today. And is that exciting? That's That has made, seriously, the highlight I'm of my excited. career. Everybody here is excited. <laughs> I'm excited. So JP is excited. Even in the background, excited. Yeah, right. we're filming so, us are excited. So We are all excited. We are all celebrating. We're all getting ready next week for GIS week. We're going to go out and do our shopping today. But Roger, you know what I'm going to buy. A uh, new weather sensor. And I know what you're buying for Anita. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's going to love that new weather sensor. Absolutely. So I hope I didn't give away the gift <laughs> idea. But ladies and gentlemen, we sure are glad that you joined us today. And as always, we wish you the best of luck, great teaching, and... Good day. Good day.